Dear Brothers and Sisters in Christ, On the 7th of November, the Holy Church commemorates the 33 martyrs at Melitini, including the holy martyr Hieron. Hieron the valiant and manly soldier of the heavenly King Christ was from Tiana of Cappadocia II. His mother was Stratonike, Stratonike, a godly woman who possessed the fear of the Lord. He lived during the reigns of the beastly and cruel co-rulers Diocletian, 284-305, and Maximian Caesar, 285, Augustus, 286-305. In the year 290, these antichrists were informed by certain defamers of the Christianity that the countries of Armenia and Cappadocia disdained their imperial edicts and were worshipping a new deity. Each emperor had identified himself with one of the gods. In Diocletian's case, it was Zeus. They dispatched two men, who were twisted in their ways and extremely crafty. The first of the ruler's representatives was Agricola, who was sent to Armenia, and then Lysias, who was assigned to Cappadocia. Their mission was to punish all those who refused to fall down and worship the idols, and to impress into military service brave men for active duty. Mad, <clears throat> the mad Lysias entered the province and began the conscription. He sought out men known for their skill and courage. Some of the inhabitants mentioned the name of our Hieron, heralding him as a mighty and valorous man. Lysias forthwith dispatched men to impress him into service. The soldiers went forth and asked about for Hierion. They found him in his field digging. The holy man saw them from afar and understood that they were seeking to fill the ranks for the war. Being a pious man, he wished to avoid being drafted not only because of the attendant hazards that come from being quartered with the ungodly, but also because all recruits were required to offer sacrifice to the emperor as to a deity. They noticed Heron and attempted to apprehend him by force, but he tightly gripped the wooden haft of his spade and raised it up against the soldiers. With this only, he repelled them bravely, even though they were trained men of war, armed with the swords and other weapons they took the, to their heels. Being ashamed before men and fearful of the punishment that their prince, Lysias, might mete out, since they were chased off by a man with no weapons except for a wooden spade, they resolved to return. This time, however, they took plenty of their comrades to assist in bringing down Hieron. Before the soldiers came, Hieron understood that they were sure to return. Now, he had a company of men, eighteen of his relatives and friends, who hid out in a cave, ready to fight off the idolaters. The soldiers discovered them in the cave and waited outside. In the meantime, the soldiers sent a message to their prince to send reserves. Lysias sent forth a certain capable brother of Hieron named Kyriakios to draw Hieron out. Kyriakios spoke to the soldiers at the mouth of the cave, advising them to withdraw. None of them dared to venture into the cave. Kyriakos then noticed, then notified them that Hieron would exit not by their application of force, but he might come forth if he were spoken to kindly. Soldiers hearkened and retreated. Kyriakos then entered the cave and finally persuaded the saint with humble words to come out. Together they went to the home of Hieron's mother, where he wished to bid her farewell and take her blessing. The old woman, hearing what was taking place, knew that the hour was about to come when her son would stand before the military commander condemned and was weeping fervently. My son is the staff of my old age. In my fearful and terrible widowhood, accompanied with blindness, he is my refreshment and help. My hopes are pinned on him, and for this I love him the more. Embracing his mother, Hieron tried to console her. He also took leave of two kinsmen, the brothers, Matronianos and Anthony, as well as other relatives. 
including Victor and everyone else. But then those three relatives together with other Christian friends decided to accompany him. The soldiers marched them on the road to Melitini when at eventide they bivouacked not sure what that word means, until the first light. During the night, there appeared one arrayed in white, with a meek voice filled with love. He addressed Hieron and said, Rejoice, Hieron! Behold, I speak to thee the promises of salvation. Know that this road which thou walkest is good and beneficial, for thou shalt contest neither for the earthly king nor for perishable glory. But thou wilt champion the heavenly king who desires to glorify thee unto the ages. Having spoken thus, the vision vanished, but left behind an ineffable joy in Hirion's heart. After he had arisen the following morning, the holy man gave a joyful account to his relatives and friends, saying, I know, brethren, the dispensation of the mystery of God of those things concerning me. I, therefore, eagerly take the path appointed to me, for there is one great treasure, one attainment, and one wealth, the heavenly, whereas all temporal things in no wise benefit a man. For what is a man profited if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? Indeed, what is more precious than the soul? The time of my past life is sufficient for me, which I spent in vanity and to no profit. So let us now go to God and rejoice with the holy slaves of God forever. One care and concern only do I have, and that is my mother, who is without means and resources in her poverty and illness. She is a widow, blind and advanced in years. There is no one left to attend to her needs. Since I go now to receive death on behalf of the Master Christ, who is the father of orphans and the judge for widows, I commit my poor mother to his governance. As he uttered these things, he wept on account of his mother. Afterward, he departed with the others toward their destination. After the soldiers arrived in Melitini, they incarcerated the saint with 33 others. Hereon, strengthening them in the face, spoke these soul-saving words to them. Hearken to my counsel, my brethren and friends. Tomorrow, the most godless governor shall exercise force that we might fall down and worship the senseless idols. Let us attend to ourselves and not cower, no matter how many torments they should render, and not offer sacrifice to inanimate creations. Indeed, much rather, let us offer sacrifice of praise to God. Let us beseech him in prayer that he might grant us power, as he is the almighty power, that we might patiently endure the tortures, and that he would bring each of us to a blessed end. They all with one mind praised these lofty words, and showed forth a wondrous readiness, saying, Thy words are sweeter above honey and the honeycomb. Thy wise counsel shall usher in life for us. The prison guards overheard Hieron and reported what he spoke to Lysias, saying, They all believe in the Christ and have contempt for the imperial commands. The following day, the prisoners were brought before the high throne of Lysias, who had been greatly angered by the intelligence he received. As they all were brought in and stood before him, he spoke with much wrath. What demon has lifted thee to such pride and mindlessness so that you choose to disdain the decrees of the autocrats and insult the great gods? The saint answered, Much rather you are proud and mindless, venerating wood, stones, and other abominations. But we, since we have knowledge and sound reason, are right-minded in that we render homage to the true God. For by the logos of the Lord were the heavens established, and all the might of them by the spirit of his mouth. The idolaters that were standing by then brought forward Hieron, saying to their prince, He is the one who beat thy soldiers with a wooden stick. Lysias questioned him, From what place dost thou come? Tiana, answered Hieron. The prince then said, 
Thou art he who is against the imperial commands? Didst thou lift up thy hand against my soldiers and flatter thyself by thinking that thou couldst put them to flight? The saint then confessed the truth, even saying with David, As for those hating my God, do I not hate them? And because of his enemies, was I not pining away? The mindless tyrant then, instead of lauding the martyr for his courage, held him in contempt and said, that was audacity and not courage, O high-minded one. I therefore charge that thy disorderly hand be cut off from the elbow. As for the others, they are to receive a merciless thrashing with bullwhips. Forthwith, the pitiless ministers executed their orders. The saints endured the pain and suffering joyfully, giving thanks to God that they were being scourged for his love. After the executioners had administered the long beating to the prisoners and severed the right hand of the blessed Hieron, they were all sent back to prison until the second examination. Hieron, seeing his right hand severed for the truth, cried out in thanksgiving while he became a model for his fellow sufferers. Now, among them was the saint's relative, Victor, whom we mentioned earlier. He was arrested with the others and suffered some scourging. The wretched one, however, became weak and cowardly from the pain of his wounds. Fearing further tortures, he secretly called the notary. He begged him with much humility to remove his name from the record, which was being kept of the prisoners, and to allow him to escape. In exchange, Victor put in writing the transfer of his estate in Karamos to the notary. The notary very happily agreed to the proposition and arranged it so that the gowler let him go. Once outside in the night air, he collapsed and died, thus losing everything in this life and the next. In the morning, Haran learned of his kinsman's folly and bitterly wailed his loss, saying, Woe is me, O victor! What hast thou transacted? Didst thou exchange everlasting life? For a fleeting one, for a small reprieve, hast thou lost unending joy and indescribable pleasure, so that thou mightest escape one day's ill treatment. Thou were about to fall into the hands of God, but, O oh, most miserable one, thou shalt burn in the unquenchable fire of Gehenna. Having wept considerably for his kinsmen, he called his other relatives, Matronianos, and Anthony. They had not been arrested, but were following the events from a distance. When they arrived, he said to them, Hearken to my final wishes, which I implore you to execute when you return to our village. I disposed my property in Pisidia to my sister Theotima for her maintenance, and so that she might keep the memorial of my martyrdom yearly. I leave the rest of the things to my incapacitated and widowed mother that she might use them to support herself through her old age. I also bequeath to my mother my severed right arm, that she might have it as a consolation in her sightlessness. Let my mother also send an epistle to His Excellency Rostikion, an administrator of the administrator of Inkira, that he might give her the house that is in Kedasani, and there keep my arm. Having pronounced these arrangements to his kinsmen, he then gave thanks, rejoicing in the Lord on account of his hope of future delights and rest. On the fourth day, the saints were further interrogated and made to suffer again at the hands of the madman Lysias. At first, he employed flatteries and then craftiness in order to pervert them from piety. He tormented them in vain, for he was unable to alter their resolve. The heartless tyrant then had them beaten with mighty blows with coarse rods, from coarse rods. Perceiving that the martyrs kept fast and immovable to their first purpose, he sentenced them all to suffer beheading outside the city. Thus they were marched to the place of execution. On the way, the holy martyrs chanted Psalm 118, beginning at, Happy are the blameless in the way the ones walking in the law, 
of the Lord. When they arrived at the execution site, they all went to their knees and entreated God that he be well disposed to receive their souls graciously into everlasting blessedness. Then their heads were severed. That same night, certain lovers of Christ came. They took up the sacred relics and buried them honorably. Anthony and Matronianos, observing closely all these events, approached the military commander Lysias. They asked for the body of their kinsman Hieron, but Lysias refused. Then they inquired, May we have at least his severed head? The avaricious Lysias replied, The head is yours if you give me its full weight in gold. The brothers, not having that much gold, were sore grieved. If they had the sum, they surely would have given it, for they indeed accounted the sacred head, which had been severed for Christ, more precious than gold. Finding themselves in this dilemma, God put it in their hearts to communicate with a certain faithful and rich Christian senator, Chrysophius, who loved the martyrs. He approached the greedy Lysias with the ransom money. After Lysias counted out the gold, the martyr honorable, martyr's honorable head was released to Chrysophius. The wealthy senator also received permission to build a shrine at the execution site. Lysias, wishing to ex extort more ransom money, began searching for the severed arm of the martyr Hieron. The diligent brothers, Matronius and Anthony, however, anticipated this and secretly fled with the sacred relic by night. When they came into their village, they found St. Hieron's mother, straight in Ike, and handed over to her that precious and most loved gift. The brothers then described in detail the martyric contests of the, saint, the saints. The old woman took the right arm of her beloved son and martyr and wept tears of joy and gladness. Her heart leaped at, as she ardently kissed the relic, and she said, O oh, my most desired child, with how many pains I labored to bring thee forth, and with how many labors and toils did I raise thee. I brought thee forth living and whole, but now, woe, I have but a portion of thee, and my pains and suffering at the remembrance of thee are increased. Even when I touch that small keepsake, I bewail thee. I had hoped to have thee as a staff in my old age, a hand leading me in my sickness, a consolation in my faint-heartedness. But what am I saying? Why am I crying? Indeed, I ought to be glad and leaping for joy, for I once offered the fruit of my womb to God, and now I have become the mother of an athlete of the Christ and a valiant martyr whom I raised and instructed in piety. Thou hast not died as other men, but thou hast received a martyr again death. And such an end ushers in everlasting benefits. But if thou must be taken from me, abandon me not to the end. Intercede for me, O thou who hast shed thy blood for the Master Christ, that I might be quickly taken from this toilsome and pain-filled life, and that my soul might be together with thee. She uttered this and many more entreaties. Straight night then placed the arm of her holy son in the place which he ordained, and did everything else that he requested to the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Through the prayers of the holy martyr Hieron and his 32 companions, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us.